Good morning. Oh. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the first thing I'll say is I'm, I'm very politely uh, co-founded Transcode. Naomi Sater co-founded as well, and realistically does most of the work. I just get to occasionally take some credit. Um, I'm going to be talking to you all about imposter syndrome and individual competence. And the first thing I'm going to do is introduce myself, even though you've just heard it. So I have, no joke, one of the best jobs in the world. I work down at FutureLearn, and I manage this team of, well, scattered team, of engineers and ops people who are absolutely, ridiculously brilliant. They're incredibly smart, they're incredibly driven, and if I'm being very, very honest on stage, a lot of times we'll be sitting down and having a chat and I'll be like, oh, those are a lot of words next to each other. I don't know any of those words. Everything's fine. Um, and all of these, oh God, everything's wrong feelings turned into this talk. Um, and let me go back a little further because way before I got into technology, I was actually a language teacher and a linguist. And I am so excited about the human brain. If you stop and think about it, your brain is this little wet ball of meat inside a bone prison. It's, it's like smaller than you think, more depressing than you think, gray. But it's also everything you've ever known. It's everything you've ever cared about, and it's everything you've ever loved. Your brain is fantastic, and it loves learning. And your brain needs to be in a very special place to learn. So Vygotsky, which is such a great guy for uh, language learning and learning theory, and almost impossible to spell to Google, he had this concept of the zone of proximal development, and this is a sweet spot in your brain. And Vygotsky said, you know what, if you're working on stuff that's a little bit too easy for you, you can do the thing, but you're not learning anything new. It's just practice. Your motivation's going to be OK, but you're not learning anything. It's not fantastic. But if you come over here and you're doing stuff that's too hard for you, you can't do the thing. Like, you could pop up in preview with a little help, but you're not going to get anything done. You're not going to learn anything, and you're going to seriously damage your motivation. Vygotsky said, hey, there's this magic sweet spot in your brain called the zone of proximal development. And that's working on stuff exactly one level, one murky hypothetical level, above where you currently are. This is where your brain is happy. Your brain loves being in the zone of proximal development. And this would be fantastic, except for the very, very fun fact that your brain has no idea how good you are. You don't know how skilled you are, you don't know how unskilled, because of cognitive biases. Um, anybody who's ever gotten to deal with teachers knows that at the end of the day, we're just as lazy as students are. So please enjoy the Wikipedia definition of a cognitive bias. Uh, but working on this talk, my husband gave me a definition of a cognitive bias I liked a lot more. So it's your brain, or probably, hopefully you driving your brain through the world, picking up bad data. We have biases attached to everything we do, every interaction. We're just pulling in bad data all over the place. And then your brain takes all this terrible data and makes you a small batch, artisanal, bespoke solution. Hey, I collected this data, and I think this thing. And because your brain made this just for you, you love it. You are never going to give this up. And this is a cognitive bias. I'm going to talk to you about imposter syndrome, which is my second favorite cognitive bias. I am a huge nerd, so eventually we'll get to my favorite. And for, if you've never heard of imposter syndrome, it's this repetitive, often intrusive thought that you have no idea what you're doing and everyone else seems fine and, oh my God, they're going to find out. I'm going to get fired. I'm going to lose my flat. I live in England and it rains and I'm going to be wet and cold and everything is terrible. Your mileage may vary on the second half. <laughs> I mean, Scotland, like, same these. <laughs> but that's very fluffy. Let's get some science. What does imposter syndrome do? Imes and Clance did the study way back in the late 70s on high-achieving women. They literally coined the term. And they said, well, you know, we studied these high-achieving women, and we found that they report imposter syndrome. Oh, like, gives them... That's kind of wrapped up in the definition. We're good with that? Oh, good! That the folks they studied not only felt like they were faking it, but when it came time to do the thing, they would take the thing somewhere else, thank you. But they also found that soft skills and social skills were used to sort of paper over, kind of smooth out where the folks they studied felt bad about their skill set. And that they worked harder. There were more contact hours studied. You worked harder and longer at the thing you thought you couldn't do. 
I'm going to get very, very scientific, and we're going to look at not just what it does, but who's impacted by it. Very scientifically, not at all anecdotally. Who's ever felt like you have no idea what you're doing and you're faking it, and everything is terrible? And very quickly, look at who doesn't have their hands up quickly, quickly, quickly before they change their minds. <laughs> so this is very scientific. But let's go to the other science folks. Ives and Clant said, "Hey, you know what? We studied these high-achieving women, and we found that high-achieving women are most likely impacted." All right, but you set out to. Vera Vasquez and Corona came around in 2006, and they said, "Well, we did a little bit more, and we find that high-achieving women of color are most likely impacted." I was like, okay, and then tons of people wrote tons of papers in the 2000s. Don't trust me. Get some Google Scholar on. It's really cool. But the TLDR is: visible minorities in a space, especially in high-achieving spaces, are most often impacted, with more reports being credited to women. But we took a real scientific study to say, oh, who here? And we've got a fairly representative group. So what's the deal with that? Why, why the mismatch between what science says and what our quick and dirty science says? I think that one of the challenges, especially in a Western context, is when you ask someone, "Hey, do you feel like you're faking it? Do you ever feel like you don't know what you're doing?" Uh, oftentimes, we find men in our our, uh, our cultures socialized to not say, "I feel anything." I say, "Hey, how are you feeling?" I'm, I'm fine. Oh, do you ever feel like you? No, no, no feelings. <laughs> hmm. uh, so, sort of the opportunity to say, "I feel like I don't know what I'm doing," is a big, scary jump that oftentimes women are more socialized to make. And visibility, seeing yourself reflected, can be a big deal too. If I'm Bob, I am a little blobby face who is very unhappy. I don't know what I'm doing. I really don't know what I'm doing. And I look around and I say, "Well." In this context, I'm at the office. Bob loves to be in the office.、I、say, well, Dave's here, and Dave and I went. We went to the same kind of schools, and we hang out a lot. We've got so much in common, and Dave seems fine, right? Dave's got it together. If I'm a little bit freaked out and I see myself reflected in my peers and my heroes, I should probably chill out. I'm a little bit like Dave. Dave belongs here. I'm going to go get a coffee. But if I'm not Dave. And I look around and I say, "Well, you know what? I, I don't I don't know what I'm doing sometimes, and everybody else seems fine." And I look around and I say, "I work with Dave. Dave's so cool. We didn't we we didn't go to the same school though, and、um, we don't have a ton in common. We don't look the same or sound the same. Or I can't really see myself in Dave's successes. That's not super helpful. I'm going to continue to freak out a little bit." And there's also a very real problem of internalizing discrimination. People who have been traditionally underrepresented in spaces are often given either subtle or extremely overt messages that this is not your space. You don't belong here. Do you know what you're doing? Can I show you how to set up? And it's very, very natural to onboard and repeat that back. So so far, we're about halfway through this talk on imposter syndrome, and all I've told you is that everything's terrible. Everything's terrible for reasons, and your brain is absolutely out to get you. Yay! If you read the abstract, I made some big weird promises. Though I was like, "Oh, I'm totally going to show you some techniques to make it a little bit better. Sometimes, maybe." Those were in very small font. But of course, you're very lovely people, right? <laughs> There's somebody like dead center back there going,、no. <laughs> "Fake, fake it."、Uh, And of course, the first thing you're like, how can I help other people with imposter syndrome, right?、Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing I'm going to give you a couple tips for other folks, and then I'm, we're going to work on the good, selfish stuff. The first thing I'm going to warn you is when somebody comes up and they tell you about something and say, "Hey, I don't really feel like I fit in. I don't feel like I belong here." Absolutely, on the pain of a messy death, do not tell them that this is just imposter syndrome. I'm going to tell you a very short story about the world's most cherubic 18-year-old at a hackathon who came up to me. I was working on JavaScript stuff. I swear quietly a lot when I work on front-end stuff. It's fine.、Um, and this this angel, this this wonderful little baby child, came up to say, "Hey, what's up?" I was like, "Oh, I'm I'm very bad at this, and I'm just going to swear my way through it. Thank you and good day." So, no, <laughs> no, angry old woman. Pop 
puppy dog cute. He was just bounding into this. You're not bad at this. You have imposter syndrome. And he, bless his cotton socks, had his whole life ahead of him. And I didn't want to go to jail, so he's fine. <laughs> But you might be interacting with people who are ready to go to jail. Like, <laughs> when folks come and tell you that this isn't working or stuff doesn't fit, they could be telling you about a poor culture fit. They could be telling you about discrimination. They could be telling you about real skills mismatches. Don't do this unless you're talking to people with a lot of mercy in their hearts. But one thing you can do is just be lovely. Give positive, actionable feedback. Say, hey, thank you so much for cleaning up those docs. I use these every day. Yet, yeah, your bad's bad at self-assessment. Your brain loves getting data points. Give other people really positive data points. And this one is a little bit high risk. If you feel like it, if you can, if it's safe, if it's good, Talk about the times that you have no idea what you're doing and you feel freaked out. I love giving this talk, because every now and some, again, somebody will come up afterwards and say, wow, you're so confident. This is like 20 minutes of everything is wrong. <laughs> Go ahead and say, sometimes everything is wrong. But if you want to fix this yourself, has anybody ever taken a really, really useful, really focused, really skills-driven assessment? Like a, no, like a certification in industry or a, no, huh? <laughs> You're like, I took some. These could be fantastic ways just to get independent, very sciencey feeling. I'm okay. This test, not always super useful. I got 90 less useful points on this. Everything is fine. But one thing I'd really love you to do is check in with yourself because it's not just. I have imposter syndrome as a big blob. It tends to be intrusive thoughts coming in saying, oh God, I don't know what I'm doing. Everyone else is fine. Everything is terrible. I'm gonna... Yeah? When you find yourself ramping up with that, take a break. Go and walk away if you can. Almost any context you have, you've got like a built-in tea break. Oh, I'm just gonna, can I get you a cup of tea while I'm up? Um, I had some really fantastic artists help with these slides, and unfortunately, I was pretty honest with them about what I do when I'm stressed. <laughs> of course, I'm told that eating in the bath is gross. So if you also do this, like, please come see me after class, because I could use like, extra data points in an argument I'm having. <laughs> if you don't want to eat cake in the bath, I am told that other, less gross people, uh, board games, read, I've not met them yet, but some people say, oh, you just need to go for a quick run. If you figure out, if you've incorporated this into your stress cycle, also see me after class. <laughs> but I want to take a little tiny detour. I've been talking to you about, hey, your brain is great, but it kind of hates you, and it's bad at self-assessment, and that's terrible. I want to sort of reframe things and wonder if we can't look at imposter syndrome in a completely different way. I want to talk to you about my absolute favorite cognitive bias. After we recap what Imes and Clant said, Imes and Clant said, imposter syndrome is this thing that sucks. All right, also sucks. That seems okay, right? Like, that's just being nice. Hey, I don't feel like I'm great at the skill. I'm going to be lovely to people? All right. And that seems like roundly good, like that's, Like, capitalism loves this. Your boss loves this. <laughs> you should probably like, go have a cup of tea, but like, half of these seem okay. Have any of you ever used um, lemon juice as invisible ink? Fabulous. For those of you who haven't, you're going to need like a pre-Brexit incandescent light bulb. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> it's, 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 it's not funny anymore. <laughs> um, and you can write stuff in lemon juice. And it's invisible till you hold it up to the heat of a, a, the light bulb. And there was a, a gentleman in the States who decided that he was going to rob a bank you know, in the afternoon. Like, so to uh, render himself invisible to CCTV, <laughs> he um, painted his face with lemon juice. And then just sort of popped up to the counter to say, hi, lovely to meet you. Clearly, you don't know me. I'd like to rob this bank. And like, while you and I may have had a giggle, there were two researchers, Dunny and Kruger, 
And I like to imagine this like on a gazebo, having breakfast like grapefruit spoons. And they knew that funding money was a thing. It's like, Dunning, oh, oh, Kruger, Kruger, yes, yes. yes. Look at this. And they're like, oh, wow, that guy thought he was a genius. Hey, what about that guy who works in our office? He thinks he's a genius. Does, does he know? Do they know? Let's do a study. So Imes and Clance, not only could they get access to money, they could access a whole bunch of students. They got 2,500 graduate students, and they said, hey, come on in. We'll give you like, some cash and a donut. I don't know how the process works. Take this test and take it away. They say, OK, well, we're going to compare your skills to other folks. This is what the distribution of test scores looked like. This is, if anybody's ever taught, this is a very, very normal, gently fictionalized test score distribution. You can tell because the people on the bottom are on the bottom, and it just seamlessly flows up. Real life, it gets wobblier. So they took all these people who had taken the test and said, hey, before we show you your scores, before we show you this gently fictionalized curve, how about you show me on a chart how you think you did relative to your peers, how good you are, how, show me your skill level, and then we'll tell you what it really is. You would be absolutely, absolutely shocked that your brain, which is garbage at giving you good input about how good you are, the people who are the least skilled, the terminally unskilled, it appears in the table several times, they think they're great. They are bopping through things. They're like, well, I mean, that test was hard. I'm great. So, I'm up. And then the closer you get to being incredibly skilled, the more likely you are to underestimate your own skill set. They had three big conclusions. And I love, love, love talking about these conclusions because every time I talk through them, someone in the audience looks real angry. You'll be delighted in your professional and personal life to know that the unskilled, the chronically unskilled, the most unskilled, they have no damn idea. They just don't know, and they sleep well at night, and everything's fine. <laughs> but you know what's so great about that? They are so functionally unskilled in the space they're unskilled in, they are completely unable to recognize what skill is. So, they think you suck. They have no idea that they lack the skill, and they're unable to recognize it. They cannot see other people who have the skill. But that's fine. Everything's fine. They could just go ahead and sort themselves out, but they won't. They will never do it unless they independently recognize their own lack of skill. Go to one. This is a wonderful, almost, you can opt out of this loop, but why would you? You sleep well at night. Everything's fine. It's not you. It's those other people on your team. Everything's great. So what I'm saying, and what I'd love you to do, is sort of change the context. When you get these messages from your brain that say, oh God, I have no idea what I'm doing, everything's terrible, everyone else seems fine, you're not actually getting a message that things are bad. It feels bad, but you're getting a really buggy error message that says, hey, you have enough skill to worry about whether or not you're not skilled enough. You're not way down there on the bottom quartile. This is your brain saying, hey, please feel very bad because you're in the zone of proximal development. <laughs> this terrified screaming that your mind does at you is just a, everything's fine! <laughs> so when you do have that feeling, and the great thing is knowing about imposter syndrome doesn't change it. The more skilled you get, the more likely you are to have this. I just want you to read this as a different message. Instead of, everything's terrible, I don't know, take this and kind of feel like you're getting one over on your brain. Feel like you're robbing a bank, but with a really good mask. Take away the value, say, hey, everything's terrible, but it's not really. My brain's just a really, really messy, meat computer, and this message is telling me everything's fine. I want you to feel like you're scamming your brain out of getting really good information. Thank you so much.